All right, it's time for some anatomy review. Are you ready? This is unit one, which is an introduction to anatomy and physiology. Okay, first we're gonna talk about topic one, which was anatomy and physiology. So remember, anatomy is a structure. So we have macroscopic or gross anatomy. That doesn't mean disgusting, it means you can see it with your eyeballs, okay? So three types, systemic, regional, and surface. Systemic by system, regional by region, like cephalic, like cervical, okay, like thoracic. And then surface, you can see it from the outside surface of the skin. So evidence of tendons, evidence of bones, okay, evidence of blood vessels from the surface. And then microscopic anatomy, we have cytology and histology. Cytology, the study of cells, histology, the study of tissues. And right here is just some extra information in case you forget. Okay, let's talk about diagnostic tools. First, we have a micrograph that uses a microscope. Then we have a sonogram or ultrasound or sonography that uses sound waves. Then we have an x-ray that uses electromagnetic radiation. Then we have a CT scan that uses a rotating series of x-rays. Then we have an MRI scan, which uses a magnetic field plus some radio waves, but important to remember the magnetic field. And then we have a PET scan that uses a radioactive tracer and it shows function. PET scan shows function. So let's look at examples of what I mean. So micrograph, microscope. Sonogram, sound waves. X-ray, electromagnetic radiation. CT scan, rotating series of x-rays. MRI scan, magnetic field, PET scan, function. All right, so here you can see some examples of the different types you're looking at the same body part, okay? Now, MRA um, shows blood vessels using contrast dye, and that one I'm not testing you on. All right, so then we get to physiology, and physiology is function. So there's cell physiology about cells, special physiology about organs, and systemic phys physiology based on body systems, and then pathology based on disease. So it's actually pathological physiology, but pathology. So why do we study anatomy and physiology together? Well, structure and function are linked. It provides a framework for how the body works and it allows us to study disease and its effects on the body, what it actually does. My cats are being wild, by the way. All right, so levels of organization from chemical or molecular level to the organism level, you should know this. We've gone over it. You've learned it in previous science courses. Remember this. Okay, the things that I want you to remember from this video that we watched already um, are these important things. So enzyme or catalyst speeds up reactions. Water is the most important nutrient. Blood pH is between 7.35 and 7.45. Diffusion is the movement of particles from high to low concentration. And then osmosis is the diffusion of water. Exocytosis, um, the vesicle contents leave the cell, like when hormones are released. Endocytosis is when the vesicle contents enter the cell, like when a white blood cell engulfs bacteria. And then cancer is uncontrolled cell growth. All right, so the body systems. So I'm just going to really quickly have these pop up here. What I'm asking you to remember for the test is not the parts, just the function, because we're going to cover each body system as we move through the year. Well, to be honest, we probably won't cover them all, but we'll see. We'll set high hopes. But what I want you to remember for this test is the function. So for example, for the integumentary system, remember it's barrier and protection. For the skeletal system, it's support and protection. It also stores minerals. And for the muscular system, it's movement, okay? So I'm just gonna click through the remaining. Remember between nervous and endocrine, nervous is the fast response system and endocrine is slow. Not so slow that you die, but a lot slower than the nervous system. And then we have lymphoid, which is immune, respiratory, and digestive systems, as well as urinary system and reproductive. So I'm gonna leave you to review that. 
All right, body positions. Remember, anatomical position. Remember what the head looks like, the palms look like, the arms look like, the legs look like, okay? And then supine, face up, lying down, prone, face down, lying down. All right, for the body planes, remember, horizontal or transverse? Frontal or coronal, like this, like separating here's how I remember separating the front of you from the back of you coronal or frontal and then mid mid sagittal right down my midline parasagittal 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 any line that's not mid sagittal so sagittal is all of them mid sagittal is one specific and parasagittal is anything that's not mid sagittal you also should know all of the body directions and we have reviewed this and I have another video. So if you don't remember it, you should go back and review that specific video. Okay. About superficial and deep, there is some confusion about this. So superficial is like at the surface. So if you have a superficial cut, it's just on the surface of your skin. If you have a deep cut, it's going further away from the surface of the skin, closer to the bone. Okay. All right, the body regions. You're just gonna have to remember them. So I made a Quizlet, I made a Blueket, and I have a video. If you're confused at all, go back to those, watch it. You just have to put in this work, you have to learn them. But we did the cephalic region, the cervical region, and then we did the thoracic region, and the abdominal region. And then we did your arm, your upper appendage, from your acromial region, to your digits and then we did the lower limb your legs from your coxal region to your digits we also talked about the abdominal pelvic regions and the abdominal pelvic quadrants for regions all I'm asking you to remember is there's nine for quadrants you should know the names right upper quadrant left upper quadrant and so on but they're not hard to remember and then what you see on the screen in red, those four, um, for each of the four quadrants, you had to remember what one example of um, where pain might be in that quadrant. So for example, if I have appendicitis, I would probably feel that in the right lower quadrant. If I have hepatitis, I will probably feel that in the right upper quadrant, okay? Then we did body cavities. You should remember the parts in each of the cavities, the names of the cavities. Remember, spinal is also vertebral. And you should remember that the diaphragm, okay, is the divider between thoracic and abdominal pelvic. All right, homeostasis. Remember, homeostasis for maintaining stable internal conditions. But remember, homeostasis is dynamic. That does not mean your body temperature is 98.6 100% of the time. It means it goes like this, up and down, up and down, up and down. But not over so great of a range, but it's going up and down, up and down, up and down. And your body just continues to monitor it. When you start sweating or shivering is only when your body recognizes the temperature has deviated too much, okay? And then we have the um, three main parts. So we have a receptor picking up a signal, a stimulus sending that message to the control center, the control center deciding what to do, sending a message to an effector, and then there's a response. So stimulus, receptor, control center, effector, response. All right, negative feedback is a return to homeostasis. It's much more common. Example is maintaining body temperature. So remember, it's maintaining blood sugar or regulating blood pressure or monitoring body temperature, okay, or controlling blood pH. It's not just itself blood pressure. An example is maintaining it, regulating it, controlling it, monitoring it. And then we have positive feedback. Remember, that moves the body further from homeostasis. It's temporary. It responds to a stress or emergency. Crisis, crisis. So three examples to remember. Fever, crisis is disease. Childbirth, crisis is, uh, I need to get this out of my uterus. And blood clotting, crisis is, you're bleeding. All right, your body responds to the crisis. 
temporarily moving your body away from homeostasis. All right, disease and case study. So disease means a failure to maintain homeostasis. The organs start to malfunction. So homeostasis responds to internal and external changes. Monitoring homeostasis, there's a compensation. If there's success, you're healthy, you're well. If there's a failure in maintaining homeostasis, sickness, disease, unfortunately, sometimes death. All right, a sign, remember, is objective. So like, I can feel your pulse rate. I can listen to your lungs and hear wheezing. I can measure your body temperature. I can see a rash. I can see your bleeding. I can use an x-ray and check your broken bone or for your sprained ankle. But a symptom is subjective. So that means there really isn't a way to verify it. There might be some signs indicating it but the symptom itself is subjective. So whether you're feeling nauseous or have fatigue or you're dizzy or lightheaded or have pain, all of those things are symptoms. Both are valid in making a diagnosis, but just understand a sign is objective and a symptom is subjective. Okay, so the signs and symptoms of inflammation. So heat, redness, swelling, pain, and loss of function. Even though they are always stated as the signs of inflammation, pain is not a sign, it is a symptom. And also heat and loss of function could be either uh, depending on the circumstance. All right, and then we talked about CERs in class. Remember, a CER has a claim, evidence, reasoning, and then it should be written in sentences, not a list. So think about this, a claim is the statement that you make reasoning is the conclusion sentence that you make tied to the claim it's like a sandwich and in the middle you put your evidence so i'll give you an example anatomy is amazing claim okay now i need three pieces of evidence in anatomy you learn all about how the body functions evidence um, in anatomy it helps you to understand when things aren't working correctly. Evidence. Anatomy prepares you for a study in a field that might be medicine related, like being a veterinarian or a physical therapist or a doctor. So three pieces of evidence. Now I need a reasoning, a sandwich, a piece of bread at the end. So for these reasons, anatomy is amazing. So claim, evidence in the middle, three, reasoning restating that claim, making a sandwich, claim reasoning sandwich with evidence in the middle. So here were just some examples from when we did um, the case study of childbed fever. So here was one that was a great job, full credit. It mentioned scientific method in the beginning, sandwiched it and men mentioned scientific method at the end. Lots of great evidence, beautiful. This one, this great evidence, but there was no claim, didn't answer the question. The question, the claim should always answer the question. So if it says, explain how this case study demonstrates the scientific method, my claim needs to mention the case study and the scientific method. It has to answer the question. And then the reasoning has to do the same thing. Remember, sandwich. Um, this one right here, there is some evidence. There's no claim or reasoning. Also, it's not really written as a full sentence. It's kind of jumbled, so that would lose points in structure. So um, make sure you're taking that into account when you're writing your CER. And then for this example, great claim, great evidence. There's no reasoning. Again, a claim and reasoning sandwich with evidence in the middle. Here's another example. This one is full credit. Claim mentions the case study and scientific method, scientific method at the end, got evidence related to the specific case study in the middle. So it doesn't have to be an essay to be correct. All right, and then in class, we're practicing with a blue kit, but that's it. So hopefully this helps you a little bit. Good luck on your test. I know you can do it.